So welcome, welcome everyone. Uh, and thanks a lot for taking the time to attend uh, one of our first events uh, at this part of the year, especially with the new EXCO uh, in uh, Singapore Alumni Club. So this is uh, the first event that we are hosting uh, a series actually, where we want to combine the work uh, that is done by an alumni, uh, combine it with the research done by one of our professors uh, and bring you a, a interesting content. Now, as part of that, uh, in that series, this is the first, uh, this is the first of uh, uh, the events that we are going to run in this series. So I thank uh, Professor Gibbs, Aruchira and Alvin for basically bringing this content, you know, especially focused on uh, coaching and leading in a hybrid world. You know, this is the topic of the time. So I hand it over to Alvin uh, to take over the proceedings, introduce the panelists and let us know how it's going to go. Uh, one uh, small uh, announcement is we are going to hang around after the panel discussion is over for, you know, 30 to 45 minutes. So we can all mingle, have a conversation with uh, Mike and uh, Mike, Kuchira and Alvin. So please feel free to stay after, uh, after the panel discussion as well. Over to you, Alvin. Thanks, Rajiv. Um, really welcome uh, to this really stimulating session. Um, it really is a pleasure to, to host this session. I mean, it's going to be very interesting. I think those of you know that in Chicago booth, we love talking about capital. And when we talk about capital is really human capital, sort of as we look at how to develop it and the relationship of human capital and productivity during these trying times. So as we start looking at that, we're gonna look at this in a couple of different manners. One, we're really privileged to have Mike Gibbs come and talk to some of the work on his research and his research on, uh, <clears throat> on working from home the productivity of remote working and some of the correlations with productivity. So Mike, Prof Gibbs, as you know, or Mike, is, as he always insists we call him, um, is one of our most popular professors at, in, our, in our booth program. Um, you know, he has been with the pro, at least the AXP group since AXP4 and uh, has continued to be a, a very favored professor. He's been three degrees in economics, all from booth. So um, and, and taught in the program for over 20 years. So um, we also have Ruchira Chowdhury, who is an ex-colleague who we met at, a, at one of our Booth alumni uh, mixers, and uh, he's a friend and a coach. Um, she's a leading executive coach, um, worked adjunct faculty at a number of prestigious universities, and worked at leadership positions in Medtronic, AI, AIG, and Tata Consultancy. So as we look at subject matter experts in the subject of human capital, I can think of uh, no more, two more worthy uh, speakers tonight. With that, I really want to talk to some of the work that Mike has done. And as the working at remote working, um, he recently just published uh, an article on his work. And that was cited in a number of leading magazines, Economist, Wall Street Journal, Wired, Time, and even GQ Germany, Mike. <laughs> So um, really interesting to see where that connection came from. So uh, we'd like to have uh, Mike, I'll ask uh, Lenora to put on the Mike slides to go through a little bit of his work. Mike? Thank you, Alvin. Although I'm not sure why you would ever question me showing up in GQ. Um, can you see my slides now? Are they visible? Yeah, yes, we can, Mike. Okay, so, great, thank you. Um, good evening, everyone, or good morning, or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, I wish I could see all of you, but I can't see your videos right now, but I really appreciate your attending. Rajiv, thank you for organizing this, and Alvin for hosting this and participating, and it's a true honor to be participating with my friend and um, inspiration, um, Ruchira, um, who has produced this amazing book here, um, which is this, the main subject of our session. Um, I'll just take a couple of minutes. I was asked to speak a little bit on some research that I'm, that I'm working on, which came out uh, the first draft about two months ago on working from home. It's very timely. The backstory is that I was working with some collaborators to do a field experiment at an Asian IT services company. We were working with an AXP alum um, who is a friend of mine, a former student who very kindly was providing us with a research site 
And we had been working with him and his colleagues at this company um, for a long time, setting up an experiment, which was going to launch in March, 2020, in which we would randomly select some new hires to get a certain kind of training, and then we'd follow their performance over time. Um, nothing at, at almost the, to the day we were gonna start this experiment, the country went into lockdown because of the pandemic. And so we could not do that experiment. But because we had the working relationship, we understand the sources of data at the company and so forth, we were able to pivot and say, okay, well, let's study what happens to um, employee performance when everyone is suddenly switched to work from home in the middle of March, 2020. And we were able to collect data on the performance of employees for a period before the pandemic and then a period during the pandemic of about five months and then compare the two. And I'm gonna very, very briefly summarize some of the things that we found. Um, but this research is somewhat unique because we have incredibly in-depth data. We have data on it, how employees spent their time, how, many, how much they worked, um, what hours of the day and so forth from a tr an employee tracking system um, developed by a company called Sapiens Analytics, which many companies use. Um, they install software on work devices that the employees have. So in this case, it'd be a laptop that they're using working from home. And they monitor the employees to, to make sure they're working on selected apps and so forth and so on. And we have those data. Um, the company also measures the employee's performance and we have that. So we have a measure of input, if you will, and a measure of output. And you can take both of those, of course, and therefore, and in that way, measure productivity. But the other thing we have is we have some data from a different analytics platform, Microsoft Workplace Analytics, which tracks employee um, emails, meetings, Zoom, or actually Teams meetings, because my, Teams is a Microsoft product, and so forth and so on. So we have measures of the type of activities that employees are doing, communicating with each other as well. Um, and I'll just go through a couple of things. So this, um, these three pictures tell the, the sort of story that's getting a lot of attention in the press, but I think it's not the most important story. In the first picture in the upper left, we have um, how many hours per day employees were working on average in this company. The vertical line is the date at which the company switched very abruptly to work from home. 98% of employees work from home mode. Before that, they were in normal working mode. And so you can see that there's a very dramatic increase in total hours worked per day when, when, when everyone went to work from home. And that persisted over the next five months. So it's not just a one-time adjustment, but people are working longer, more hours um, in work from home mode. And I think this is true in other studies in um, other companies and countries as well. Um, that's the, what the uh, picture on the right shows our, what we call output. And this is a measure of employee's performance against the defined goals, um, which are specified by the supervisor for each employee. And we see here that output or performance, if you will, as measured um, by the supervisor uh, for the employee is basically the same during work from home as, as before. There's actually a slight decline and then in the third slide is, or the third picture is essentially the ratio of those output over input. And we see a dramatic fall in productivity. So people are working longer to achieve the same results. And the fall in productivity is something like 10 to 25%, depending on how you measure it. This is a very large effect. And this is, this is interesting because the only other study that was ever done of something like this found that productivity increased in work from home, but that was call center workers for a travel company in China. Very, very different kind of work. In this case, we have IT professionals, highly skilled, college educated, doing cognitive work, a lot of collaboration, a lot of work with clients and so forth. So this is um, more like knowledge work. Uh, very briefly, um, we have a couple of other pieces of information about how people are spending their time. We see total working hours rose. And um, in the second picture, the one on the upper right, we see that people are working more hours outside of normal work hours, more hours in the evening, on weekends, early in the morning, and so forth. I'm sure all of you can relate to this. In the bottom left, we have a measure of, the, um, of what that we call focus hours, which is the number of hours per day that we spend not interrupted by email, chat, um, Zoom and team meetings and so forth and so on. And we see that that has fallen significantly. 
during work from home, people are being interrupted more at work by various kinds of interactions with colleagues and clients and so forth. And then the last one is a measure that the number of hours were spent collaborating with other people in some kind of a meeting or an email exchange or something like that, a phone call. Um, and that has increased as well. Email has not changed, but I can't resist putting up what I call the Zoom Doom picture, which is the one on the right. The use of these video meetings exploded. In this case, it's Microsoft Teams, but it's exactly what we're doing right now, of course. All of us living on Zoom or Teams absolutely exploded during this period of time. Um, and then what we did is we have these, we have these measures that suggesting productivity has fallen, but then the question is why is productivity falling? We have a bunch of other kinds of variables that we looked at. So I'm very briefly gonna summarize that and then I'm gonna turn things back over to Alvin. Um, the first thing we found is we have information on whether these employees have children at home or not. And working parents um, had a larger fall in productivity than those who didn't have children at home. Now, in this company, we didn't find any difference in gender that this, this effect is true, whether the working parent is female or male. Um, that said, female employees did have a larger drop in productivity relative to men, but it does not appear to be caused by children per se, but by something else. Um, the next thing we found is that those who were more experienced have worked longer in their careers and at the company were able to work from home more effectively. So productivity fell more for the more inexperienced. We, then we, we may come back and talk about that a little bit. And then we measured the extent to which employees' job involves collaborating with others before work from home, more meetings, more email exchanges, more interactions with people outside the organization, maybe clients and so forth. And what we found is if your job involved more collaboration, your productivity is more likely to decrease in work from home. All right, and then the most important cause of the decline in productivity statistically was this measure I, I mentioned earlier, focus hours. The more that you had a fall in focus hours, the more your productivity fell and vice versa. Um, but another thing we found is that the, the more that, that your ability, to, that, that, excuse me, the more that your contacts with colleagues and clients fell during work from home, the more your productivity fell as well. Okay, so putting those kinds of things together, what we conclude is that, in, is that productivity fell because collaboration and coordination and communicating with each other is just more difficult to do effectively in a virtual environment. Thank you, Alvin. Yeah, thanks, Mike. And one call in regards to, as we've all went from a full shift of um, work from home and now we move toward the hybrid, you know, that this new hybrid of the new normal, any thoughts on productivity and the models that we would like to be looking at? Yeah, um, I think um, our study is somewhat misleading because it's 98% work from home abruptly. Um, and that's not the reality that any of us are gonna be facing soon. Um, so I think of this as a pathological study, like in medical school, you study extreme cases to learn something about the normal cases. Um, so when we say productivity fell by 20%, I wouldn't be worrying about that as much in a hybrid environment. In a hybrid environment, we could do the best of both worlds, you know, work from home a little bit, get more flexibility. So I would expect productivity to fall less, um, might even increase, um, it's hard to say. Um, but the, the things I highlighted at the end about co co communication and collaboration are more difficult in a virtual environment, that's the key point for me. We have to find ways to make our, uh, to work more effectively together in a hybrid environment, either by making sure we find time to be together in person um, when we're not working from home uh, or finding ways to collaborate more effectively on a computer screen. Sure, thanks Mike. And we're gonna circle back and you know um, come back to that, but I wanted to one, uh, talk a little bit about Rachira's work. And so one, Rachira, congratulations on your book, I know uh, you wrote it in and out of you know, and edited during lockdown, and we'll talk a little bit about um, this, um, the book. Um, really, congratulations. So number one, um, you know, again, as, as part of the plug, you know, here's the book. And um, you're not hold it. <laughs> I'll try. Yeah. So um, I think that this book, I guess, was released uh, late last year, uh, or no, early this year. 
Um, now I think it's number one on Amazon France in some of the workplace sessions, a number of, of the reading lists of a number of prestigious universities. Um, I've seen a lot of um, work in, you know, a very positive review in Forbes and US journals and a number of podcasts in all over Asia and around the world. And, you know, the great forward by Sheryl Sandberg. So one, congratulations. And it's always great to see uh, a fellow alumni do really well and, and get a book published. So one, uh, congrats on, on the great work. So what I'd like to do is um, tell us a little bit about what really drove you to wrote the book and, and tell us a little bit about it. So maybe Lenora, if you can get the slides. Alvin, thank you so much. Um, and firstly, I think I need to say thank you to the Singapore Alum Club, um, Southeast Asia Club. I've, to be fair, uh, Booth has been very supportive and I've done several, several other uh, you know, podcasts and chats with the Chicago Booth Women's Network. I've done some for the UK Alumni Club, but as a lot of you know, this is very special to me. Singapore has been home for 12 years. And much as I'm disappointed that I can't be here in person, um, it's just fantastic that I have this platform to be able to catch up with so many of my classmates, people that I've known over the years. And I guess I'm also, I also feel very blessed and privileged that I'm in conversation with two individuals who've been, very, uh, who've been a very integral part of this book writing journey. Uh, Mike has been a mentor and guide and Alvin's been, I guess, the guy who's been giving me a lot of tough love coaching. So between the two of them, I've been very fortunate to have the ability to write this book. Uh, the book released late January in India, which is where I'm based currently. It was commissioned by Penguin House in India, Penguin Random House. And they've been doing it sort of uh, in a tiered fashion. It went um, live in the Western world, UK, Europe, Canada in about March, but Singapore held back because of all the restrictions. So it's just released in Singapore bookstores uh, two days ago. So for those of you who are based in Singapore, it's in Kinokunya and a lot of other leading bookstores and also available online on Amazon or otherwise. So that's on the book. Um, I'm happy for you to show them my face. Uh, I think they've seen the book. What would you like me to do next? Tell you more about the writing journey, Alvin? Yeah, absolutely. So what really drove you and, and what, you know, what, what sure. drove you toward your journey on, co you know, the, the subject of coaching? Yeah, so I think uh, just you'll have to humor me a bit. It's a slightly longish story, but I think it's a story that I'd like to tell because uh, this I'll split this story into two parts. How I got into coaching in the first place and then what drove me to write the book. And the reason I think it's an important story to tell is because Chicago Booth played a very instrumental role in this journey. In many ways, Booth has been the inspiration for getting into this field of coaching. Um, I've never thought of myself as a coach. Some of my classmates are here, they'll know that. Um, I was, uh, you know, working in a, in a large financial services organization. I stood on part of strategy and organization design for them. It was 2013, just the previous year, I'd graduated from Booth, AXP, I'm AXP 11. And, you know, I thought that armed with my new skills from Booth, I could just change the world or at least the corporate world. Now, the reality was very different. I saw myself stuck in an organization which had a fairly toxic culture and there was a complete vacuum of any kind of enablement or coaching of any kind. It was a very turbulent time in my career. And I received a call from uh, Arnie, Arnold Longboy. Some of you might know him. He's uh, Alvin's batch, I think. He used to run the executive education for Booth. Uh, for Asia and uh, Europe. And Arnie was looking for an executive coach for the ADP program, uh, the newly minted ADP program for Asia and Singapore. And uh, he'd been referred, uh, he'd been given my reference by a few people and he was urging me to come on board and be that coach. And I was anyways on my way out, but I was very skeptical about it because uh, a lot of you will appreciate that the business school that I graduated from is rather numerically skewed, right? Things like coaching are seen as very fuzzy and amorphous. And I didn't know better either. Um, a lot of people said that when I have conversations with them, I give them clarity. I help them think better. I'm able to uh, demystify the jargon. But I never thought of myself as a coach. So when this opportunity presented itself at a juncture in my life where I was quite keen to leave the, the corporate world, um, I embraced it, uh, some soul searching, but I embraced it. And the rest, as they say, is history. Then I became the resident executive coach for ADP at Chicago Booth. 
And um, I realized once I embarked on this coaching journey, it was a deeply fulfilling experience for me. I was able to untangle a lot of knots in a leader's head. My background uh, in Booth in, uh, sort of helped me assimilate the classroom learnings with a leader's trials and tribulations. And as many of you know, Singapore is a, a little island, it's a village. Um, other business schools found out about me and I started teaching this class uh, and coaching for them uh, you know, in other business schools like NUS and SMU. Thanks to Arnie, I also started teaching a course um, at, at Booth for the executive ed students called the Leader is Coach. So long-winded story to tell you that once I embraced the world of coaching, I realized that uh, I truly enjoyed it. And when the opportunity came to write a book, I just moved to India and uh, I'd written a column for a leading in business daily called The Mint. And when Penguin Random House saw it and said, you know, we'd love you to write a book, I said to myself, this is truly a compelling message. And I, and the reason I say that is having worked in the last organization that I talked about, where I saw a complete vacuum of coaching. And by contrast, I've also had ex-clients, um, bosses, I've had senior colleagues, I have educators like Mike. I know what good looks like and I know what it is. And I know this journey of enablement can do so much for the individual. It's changed my own leadership narrative. So I thought this was a compelling message and a message that I should write about now that I had the opportunity and hence the book was born. So Richard, I mean, tell us a little bit more about, you know, coaching, you know, what, what's that definition? And, you know, um, just give us some examples of who you think, you know, is an uncommon coach. Um, <laughs> uncommon coach uh, is, there's one right here in front of us, but let's define coaching first. Uh, as I said earlier, I think of it as untangling knots in a, in a leader's head, in somebody's head, right? There's so much noise. We, we know the answers, they lie within us, but you, we, our thoughts form these knots and somebody like me or another coach will help you untangle those knots and make them and weave them into patterns, right? So give you clarity. But also, uh, if you look at the definition of coaching, Google it and you'll have, find some 800,000 hits. But the one that I've embraced and used in the book is uh, coaching is the ability to maximize the, the current potential of the individual, maximize the potential and performance of the individual through a series of non-directive self-enabling interactions. But the keywords here are non-directive and self-enabling, which means you ask the right questions so people find the answers. You don't tell them what to do. And that's a skill that has to be developed. Doesn't come naturally to a lot of us because we've been taught through business school, through college, that good managers have all the answers, right? So coaching is all about helping people find their own answers. Okay, thanks. And, and, and Mike, you know, any thoughts from you about your know, uncommon leaders and, and coaches that you've that you encountered? Um, well, un unfortunately, Alvin, I don't have experience with a good mentor or coach. I do have an experience with a tour mentor. Okay. Um, my, my first boss was actually a Booth alum who hired me in my first job as a professor at Harvard Business School, and he was horrible. And I know this is being recorded, but he's retired now and I don't care. You know, <laughs> he was just absolutely awful. Um, he had a clear view of what, he, how he thought the world worked and he wanted me to do research that aligned with his view of how the world worked. And I was working on a paper on performance evaluation and feedback and coaching incidentally. And he hated the implication of it, which had to do with, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, and he kept pushing back on me. And, you know, as a junior person trying to create new research, you know, it's creative work to have someone say, this is the answer you should get. And you're, you're wrong because you're doing the wrong answer it was absolutely frustrating. And, you know, I, I wrote down something that um, Ruchira said about non-directive. He was clearly being directive and that's not the way to coach someone. Coaching is about helping someone realize their potential, not your view of what their potential is. It's bringing out what's in them, which you don't know and they don't know. And, and so th thanks, Mike. And you're in your book, you talked a lot about, um, you know, a coach versus a mentor, you know, and I know m many, you know, it's quite popular to have in rigor to have, quote, you know, everyone gets a mentor or a mentee relationship in a lot of organizations, but how does that differ from a coach 
and what would you prefer or how does that embed in an organization? I think it's a fantastic question. Um, in fact, when you talk about coaching, it's, it, I've started the chapter on, um, on getting started on your coaching journey by first defining the difference between a mentor and a coach. Organizations and individuals have been using it interchangeably. Having said that, there's great merit in having both and there may be overlaps, but the, the fine difference is a mentor is someone who guides your career journey or your life journey for that matter. A coach is someone who guides your current practice. Now let me elaborate or let me unpack the thought. When you think mentor, think someone typically older with wisdom, someone who's dispensing knowledge. This individual is telling you, I, I don't mean Mike, huh? just, just to clarify. Someone who's, dis, who's telling you, this is how it can be done. I've done this. Um, you know, this is what made me successful in the past. They truly dispense advice and wisdom. That's their role. So they're telling you. The, the key difference is telling versus asking. A coach is someone who is typically in your current um, professional ecosystem. Ideally your boss, but could be a colleague, could be your boss's boss. But this individual is not giving you advice from the balcony. He or she is there where all the action is taking place or on the, on the dance floor, as we say, when we give the analogy, the balcony versus the dance floor. And they're helping you become more capable, give you more clarity. They give you a greater self-awareness and also the confidence to go forward. And they do that by asking you powerful questions so that you can find the answers yourself. Question, internal versus external. I mean, as we start looking at the coach, you know, is it better to have someone that's in your organization? Or I know it's very popular to have an external coach like yourself, a very expensive to have, you know, an executive external coach. But what would work well in an organization to, to an individual? So the whole premise of the book is leaders as coaches, right? Uh, yeah. Coaching the secret code to uncommon leadership. I, this is not a book about coaching skills, neither is it a book about leadership. There are enough good books in the market for that. This is a book about uncommon leadership. And I've talked about how coaching or the act of enabling others is that key or the code that unlocks uncommon leadership. Now, what I'm saying through the various chapters is that more than ever today, every leader has to be a coach. Every leader has to enable, empower, elevate others. You have to take people along in the journey. There's no substitute for that. I think in simple words, what I'm saying is you cannot be a leader without being a coach. That is part and parcel of who you are. You cannot say that leadership and coaching are two separate disciplines. In fact, when you do that, you almost put the burden on the individual as in, this is something extra you have to do. Right? So coaching has to be a subset of leadership. Uh, to your question about external coaches, I've never said it's a bad thing. In fact, I think the two can tag team and you just have to be cognizant at what junctures you need to bring in an external coach because we don't want external coaches like myself becoming crutches. So think about, um, let me think of an analogy, right? Think about the manager or the leader as someone who has to ensure that your, your, your attire or your shirt is always crisply ironed. You're always done. Bring in that coach to just iron out a, struggle, a stubborn wrinkle, right? Because you have to make sure that you, the individual is always uh, going higher, that you're constantly bringing out the best in the person, shining the light on them, elevating them as you elevate your organization, as you elevate yourself. That is what you have to do. But bring in those experts by all means. Uh, to go the extra mile at certain junctures in the organization's life cycle uh, during transition times. And, you know, that's a conversation that can be had later, but it needs to be, it, the twain can tag team. Sure, sure. And when you talked about, you've talked about four cornerstones of coaching. Can you sort of elaborate what those look like? Sure, we have a slide, uh, might be easier. If, if uh, Lenora can put that on, I'd be happy to just... Uh, so while she puts on the slide, let me give you some background. Um, as I was writing this chapter, it's called the 4C model, the four cornerstones of coaching. I have to be very honest. Um, this is a safe space, so I can say that. Um, as I was trying to define what coaching does for somebody, what are the coaching outcomes? I was really struggling at that point. And despite having you know, been a coach, leading executive coach, as uh, Alvin called me, I couldn't really define or articulate in simple terms what coaching does. I looked at a lot of HR journals. I looked at coaching websites. I did a fair bit of research, I must admit. 
but i wasn't being i wasn't being able to clearly simplify or articulate for somebody uh, what coaching would do you for your coachee for your colleague or the person that you wish to take to the next level and i found the inspiration in a series of you know rather unconventional sources my son was watching the kung fu panda for i don't know the 50th time and i never usually hang around but in this instance i did and i realized that if you look at a lot of this unconventional media films sport uh, performing arts it has many many life lessons and business lessons so i put together a four c's model it's called the four c plus model the four cornerstones of coaching the first one is capability right when you coach somebody you make that individual more capable and you do, you do that by helping them spark creativity tapping on those reservoirs of innovation that you didn't know existed it's about helping them look forward into the horizon and not concentrate or focus on the near term goals right it's also about helping them assemble or invent their own career ladders we keep talking about careers ladders as being straight straight line or vertical ladders and i think the point i'm making in the book uh, in many ways is your career could be a framework it could have squiggly lines it doesn't have to be linear it doesn't have to be vertical the second bit is confidence and confidence is really the self belief to overcome challenges and go forward it spurs action that's what confidence is about it's not just about feeling good about yourself you give people the assurance that they have it in them to do it clarity is about really as i said earlier untangling those knots in your head it's giving you direction and consciousness is another word i use for self awareness help you understand your strengths your weaknesses your blind spots and all of this comes alive if you if you put this on a foundation of a coaching culture an organization and or individuals that permeate a culture of coaching that cascade a culture of coaching truly can bring this to life Can you talk a little bit about what that culture aspect? I mean, what does culture in, in in an organization and maybe give us some examples of a good culture organization and maybe a a toxic culture. And I think we all have examples of a toxic culture, but tell me give me give me some tangible things that you would look for if you're looking at a culture within an organization. So I've used um, <clears throat> the case study of Microsoft to talk about what good looks like. Of course I'm biased. I mean, Satya Nadella is a much respected alum for us but he's truly changed the you know changed the narrative from the time that he took over a rather broken and siloed microsoft to where it is today just see the valuation and in his own words it wasn't about the cloud computing or the ai or the accent on the business strategy what in his own words what he did differently was focus on the culture of the organization uh, he says the c in ceo for me stands for culture and he's gone about and i think the first few things he started was he said i have to in order to change uh, the cultural ethos of this organization we have to start listening to people remember this was a time where uh, they had pitted one function against another they were completely siloed uh, the work culture was very toxic nobody wanted to work at microsoft anymore and so he said he spent the first two years along with his head of hr kathleen hogan who has very generously given endorsed my book as well they the two of them tag team and they spent a lot of time listening to people and they really wanted to listen and assimilate again a completely underrated skill but something you need as a good leader coach listen to people understood where they were coming from and they went back to the drawing board to then recraft some of the policies um, at microsoft but to go back to your cultural uh, the question on that you can make a coaching culture come alive not just by the visible visible nuances but you also have to go deeper you have to think about how you measure people how you promote people how you celebrate people so are we only looking at promoting those that have achieved our numbers or are we also going to give importance or significance to leaders that have built other leaders right is there a metric for that so measure what matters in my words um think about how you hire people is it all about the experience and the skills that they bring to the table or can we also think about the attitude because as you know a lot of experts are now now, now saying that attitude is everything skills can be skills can be learned domain can be learned but you need to come in with a mindset that building the next line of leaders is your responsibility and you have to track that right so it's about the architecture of the organization 
It's about the design of the organization, who reports to whom, how often we communicate. But I think the point I'm making is it's not about one Satya Nadella. What Satya has done right is he's cascaded that culture he, that seeped into the DNA of Microsoft. They have a model, uh, they have a framework rather. It's called uh, model coach care. So every leader has to model that behavior. Every leader has to coach another leader and care, i.e. empathy. You have to look after your people. And they actually get rated on that. So it's not one of those sort of you know, models that you have or a framework that you have. It's called their excellence, performance excellence framework. And talk to anybody in Microsoft. We have so many alums. They all embody it. You can see the passion. In fact, I uh, wasn't, it, Microsoft wasn't on my radar. I was, I just signed up uh, on this book contract with Penguin. And I started researching them because uh, a good friend and alum, Yvonne, who's based in Dubai, I was there for a, a work meeting. She said to me, how can you not read Satya's book? You have to read Hit Refresh. That would be the base for you to get started. And I'm so glad I did, right? So I've used that as a case study. I've had I have lots of quotes from people from Microsoft. And uh, of course, Kathleen Hogan then endorsed the book. But I'm saying he truly is a leader that embodies that coaching culture that you talked about. And um, it'll become a very long-winded answer, but I've talked about it in the book. The firm that I worked in or the likes of an Enron long, long back would be classic examples of organizations that had Coaching was very, very, was ne never on their radar. It was the antithesis of what coaching or enablement meant. It was really all about promoting the A-listers, giving them disproportionate amounts of power, influence, and not really tracking um, progress in terms of developing people. So Enron would be a classic example of an organization that went up in flames, literally and metaphorically. Thank you. So, um we, we talked about, you know, in, in the coaching crisis, I mean, we'll probably take it back to the personal um, thought about, you know, writing this book, you know, during the middle of the Corona crisis. And, you know, what are the learnings and, you know, that you personally had, um, to, you know, stuck in Mumbai writing this and the impact of your productivity? I won't lie to you, uh, Alvin, you're a dear friend. I didn't really write the book during the pandemic. It was quite ready to go by the time the pandemic happened. I wrote the book uh, while traveling to Singapore because I used to, I, until recently, I divided my time uh, between Singapore and India. And then I couldn't come back into Singapore without doing the quarantine. So I, you know, it, it, the book contract came at a time, it was a very busy time for me. I was doing a lot of work in the Middle East. I was back and forth in Singapore where my businesses are based. And I, Penguin was constantly chasing me and I sort of missed my deadlines a few times. And, you know, by the time December 2019 came about, you know, there was light at the end of the tunnel. By March, I had sharpened and honed everything and I was ready to give my manuscript. And then they stopped calling me. Nobody called me for a long time. And it was very disconcerting, right? Because people were chasing you every week. And then I said to him, I said, what's, what's going to become of the book? He said, I don't know because the printing presses are shut. We, we don't even know if we can release this book for a long time. But fortunately, given, I guess, the relevance of the topic and the world did finally sort of, things started getting better. So about September, we started talking about releasing it when things started opening up. But to answer your question, what the, that period, uh, that time in the lockdown um, gave me was perspective and to think, to think about how I would need to rejig and uh, revise some of those chapters. Because a lot of the, the narrative focuses on face-to-face -face coaching, right? I, and, and by my own admission, uh, I've, never been a fa I've never been a fan of virtual coaching. We had a, we had a similar webinar with you, Chicago in August, um, and Mike was part of that. And I said to him, I'm not a fan of virtual coaching, but you know, you've got to eat your words because now the world has changed. And so I had to go back and uh, rejig some of the chapters, relook at it, and I put in place some constructs that talk about how you will coach and lead in the times of corona crisis, i.e. work from home. So we put in those um, principles and constructs. And now, of course, we're grappling with a different reality. It's added a, another layer of complexity, which is it's not just about working from home. It's about a hybrid model, which is here to stay. And I want to go back to Mike with regards to that product, you know, the, that coaching opportunities in your work and any perspective on that, Mike? Yeah, I was just going to raise my hand. Thanks, Alvin. Um, Ruchira reminded me that one thing that in our study, we found that certain types of meetings became less common. One of those was one-on-one -on -one meetings with your manager. 
Another was any kind of meetings in which your manager attended. And another was coaching meetings. And, you know, what we found is that productivity fell, but productivity was the measurable part of the job. We couldn't study any intangibles. But one thing we, that we wrote in the paper is that we suspected that intangibles were also going to suffer from this virtual world. Um, you, know, if, you know, when we see that there are fewer coaching meetings, fewer one-on-one -on -one meetings with your supervisor, this suggests that people are not being coached or mentored or, or even evaluated in the way that they used to. Collaboration is less likely. And then there's innovation. Innovation often occurs because people bump into each other in the lobby of the House of Tanyokni in Singapore or something um, where we're all sitting in the same chair right now. Um, and that also suffers. So I was going to actually try to call on Ruchira and ask, how, how do you try to coach more effectively in a virtual setting? Because it's, you know, my evidence suggests it's more difficult and it's being done less. Thank you, Mike. Um, I've added an afterword uh, as I was telling you the book was ready to go into print, but we needed to make it more relevant because the world as we knew it had completely changed. So um, I, I think my, in, in writing this book now, my message has been fairly simple. Coaching has never been more important than it is today, given our extremely choppy waters. These are very turbulent times for us, right? Mm -hmm. And I think I would think of trust and empathy as the rudders that a leader needs to use to navigate these choppy waters. But I mean, trust, I'm, I talk, I want to talk about building those reservoirs of trust. So if you read Mike's articles, he talks about how the reason there are so many meetings also after work, and please, Mike, correct me if I'm wrong, is because managers don't feel the same sense of commitment and constantly need to check on their people. You, if you see other research, HBR has done a study, Microsoft done a study, and what that research is telling you that nearly 40% of man, uh, leaders are not trusting their people. Or if you look at the river, 60% of employees feel that their managers don't trust them enough and they constantly want to check in on them. They feel stressed and burnt out because their personal and professional worlds are colliding. They always need to be on call to answer queries, to be available for meetings. And the time that they spent um, in meetings after work uh, has gone up by 25%. Microsoft says that people now spend triple the time of amount they used to working over weekends. Not a happy picture. I don't have the answer to it, but I think more than now, it is critical that as leaders, we build those reservoirs of trust. And what I mean is check in, check in on your people. Find out how they're doing. Don't let them slack off, but find that balance between slacking off and cutting some slack. You also have to up the ante on empathy. Conversations about burnout, grief, these are real things. And as leaders, some of us do it, but for a lot of us, this doesn't come naturally. And it's even harder through a screen. So empathy, trust. Empathy also means recognizing that we're not in the same storm. We may be no, we're all in the same storm. We may not all be in the same boat. Some of us could have luxury liners and some of us could be in a canoe or struggling with a lifeboat. Patchy internet connections, barking dogs, all of those things notwithstanding. So we have to appreciate the, the, the reality of our people and it's not the same. But if you sort of take it to the next level, to me, there are three or four constructs of coaching virtually and now in the hybrid world, which is, Take people's opinion into cognizance, right? Involve them in decision-making. As our world will change into a hybrid reality, make sure you involve them. You give them a platform to voice their opinions because remember the best ideas can come from anywhere. That's also coaching. When you give them the ability to tell them what works for them, what doesn't work for them, make them part of the process. If you look at Mike's research and what world the... I think the World Economic Forum research, WEF has published a paper in the Wall Street Journal. They're also saying that people are now quitting jobs. In the US, they've never seen such a large number of people dropping out of the workforce by design. And, the, and those that are leaving the workforce, um, not just, I mean, not because it's just millennials who want to do things differently, that people who are burnt out, it's those that have never been to the physical office. So the, the connections that we all crave are completely absent or missing. So as a manager or a leader, you have to work extra hard 
to focus on these individuals, those that have never physically been to the workspace. Remember, they don't have those connections. They don't have a frame of reference or a sense of belonging. The third bit, which is true for a hybrid or otherwise, is you have to be present in the moment, right? Leave those uh, mobile phones out of the frame. When you have a coaching conversation or any conversation, be present. As Peter Drucker said, when you look out of the window, see what's visible, but also see what's not visible. Pick up the spoken words, but also see the cues. When you find a team member who's struggling in a meeting, find the time to speak with them separately. Check in on them. It doesn't always have to be a video call. It could be a WhatsApp message. It could be a text message. You need to make that time. And what works and research is telling us in a work from home or a hybrid scenario is shorter bite-sized conversations. As Mike was saying earlier, we're all zoomed out. We're all burnt out. So we need to find that balance in terms of the right medium. And the last thing I will say is you have to be inclusive. Now, especially as the world is opening up to this hybrid reality, we don't know the shape and form it will take. And Microsoft can have the best conference rooms with the fan most fantastic te technology, but in the end, it's about people. So you have to, you have to make the space for those that are in office and those that are not in office. Especially when you have your decision-making principle, uh, you have to take the opinions of those that are in front of you and those that are not in front of you, and that's hard work. But leadership is hard work. Whoever said it was easy. You're muted. Zoom, Zoom, Zoom full pop. Uh, you talked a little bit about inclusiveness and diversity. And, and Mike, you, you talked, to, go back to your work about um, some of the females that, you know, when managing the productivity dropped working from home and the challenges they have. Can you comment a little bit about that? And then Richir, I want to go back to you a little bit about, um, you know, coaching for female leaders, especially during this time. But Mike, you know, comment a little bit about that aspect of your work. Um, sure. Uh, just uh, to refresh the memory of the group here, what we found is that productivity fell more for women than for men. Productivity fell more for those who had children at home than for those who didn't. But that, that second effect, the parenting effect, was not different for men versus women. So for some other reason, um, working from home led to a fall, greater fall in productivity for women than for men in this company. Now, this is one company. This is one data point, and I'm not sure how generalizable this would be. In fact, our, our U.S. audiences have been a little surprised. They would have expected a bigger hit for working mothers than working fathers from working from home, and I suspect that's true in the U.S. Contextually, the, the country where this company is located is one um, where many live in extended families at home. You may have three generations or more in one household. Um, there may be um, household help and so forth, so that might be a contributing factor. Um, but the thing that I think is particularly noteworthy is that working from home for whatever reason seems to be less effective for women than for men. And I think that is true in other studies in other countries, including the United States. And it's worth thinking about why that's the case. Um, you know, and it might be an indication of a more general pattern um, that we see, the, the glass ceiling effect, um, to put it very, very briefly. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Richard, talk about, and we look at leadership, uh, female leadership and developing female leaders. How would you think this the implication is on, on developing some of the female leaders in, in an organization? So when the pandemic hit us, February 2020, from then to now, I believe 2.3 million women have are out of the workspace, approximately those numbers. In fact, uh, when the pandemic first started, the uh, economists dubbed it a she session because the number of women disproportionately, disproportionately were dropping out of the workforce because of the reasons that Mike articulated, right? Um, they were primarily, this is US data, they were primarily shouldering all the household responsibilities. They also and happened teaching. to be in service sector. Hmm? And teaching, kids were working from and home. And teaching, teaching, yeah, teaching. So kids were working from home. Uh, you had familial responsibilities. Also, a lot of these women worked in service sectors, the hotel industry, where you had to be present at work. Mm -hmm. So there's a combination of these factors that led to this. And so whether it's lack of sponsorship, biases, um, a lot of the reasons that Mike articulated, um, these existed prior to the pandemic, but the pandemic just exacerbated that, right? There's... The big factor that I have used uh, as part of the coaching construct is what I call the confidence gap. 
It's not a term I invented. There are experts who've been saying that. Re study after study tells us that women, often successful women, more often than not super successful women, are plagued by self-doubts. Call it the imposter syndrome or the sticky floor syndrome. These women constantly undervalue themselves. They will not talk about their achievements. When they do well, they will constantly say that this happened to them by accident in casual conversations. They won't raise their hands for promotions. They will not ask for job raises. They will not negotiate hard. And at the heart of all of that is the lack of self-confidence. We have nature over nurture. No, in fact, this is nurture over nature because we've been conditioned to believe that unless we are perfect or nearly perfect, we, we don't raise our hand for that job, for that coveted job or for that assignment. There's a, there's a very well-known HP study which talks about how they were tracking the data uh, when they wanted to ha have more senior women uh, in, the, in the leadership. And they realized that men would apply for those same jobs when they were 60% prepared or ticked 60% of the boxes. Uh, women would do it when they were 100 or 110% prepared. So this is telling us something about what I call the ability to bridge that confidence gap. And unless we do that, unless we give women the confidence to believe in themselves, to go forward, we're a long way off for bringing more women into the C-suite or senior roles. And I think as a coach, this is a fantastic opportunity for you to focus on that cornerstone. What I'm saying is you're coaching, the goals have to be the same for both genders but your journey can be slightly different. And I talked about the four cornerstones, the capability, the consciousness, uh, you know, focus more on the confidence factor, right? Give them the clarity, give them the capability, give them the consciousness, but confidence is what comes in the way of going forward. And uh, I was recently invited uh, to a conference where they were discussing women's issues and they said, specifically tell us what you will do in the pandemic. And I don't know if it's the right answer, but all I would say is now more than ever, you have to give them the self-belief and the confidence to go forward. And it's simple things like believing that your job is equally important. Believing that what you do for a living is critical because you can't coach the partner and you can't coach the, you know, the ecosystem in which you are. But unless you believe you're adding value, unless you believe in yourself, it's hard work. The reason we're dropping out of the workforce, the reason we are struggling so much is also because at a, at a broader, at a very basic level, it's that lack of self-confidence that I have it in me to go forward. And I think it's a huge opportunity here for a leader, a manager to coach and take a lot of your women leaders ahead by giving them more confidence. Thank you, Richard. Mike, you had a comment or a question? Yeah, two quick ones. Um, one is to the extent that we can stereotype men versus women, um, which Rutir just did, and I'll do the same. Um, you know, I think a lot of research suggests that women are relatively more effective in a collaborative teamwork a mode of engagement than men. You know, not putting any judgment on that, different styles of interacting. And, you know, my research suggests that teamwork and collaboration are more difficult in a virtual environment. And if that's putting those two together, that would suggest a disadvantage for women in a virtual environment. And this is a challenge that organizations, I think, um, need to think hard about to the extent we're going to be doing work from home. The second thing I want to do really briefly, it just occurred to me, we can flip the perspective. We're talking about leadership and coaching, but you can talk about being coached or, or how do I behave, not how does my coach behave. And one thing that's important in a virtual world is I need to think differently about how I do my work and engage with people. And I need to be proactive about that. And that, that may be how I do that might differ if I'm a woman or if I'm a man. Just throw that out there as well for our audience that each of us has to think about how do I approach the virtual work. Sure. So I think we've actually gone to the, um, I think we've had a chat thing about the, the chat. I think it's actually uh, disabled, but it's no matter. I think, we, you know, we, you know, we were almost at the end of the, you know, the formal session. I know, Mike, you had one question to ask. And to, to go through that before that, um, so uh, Mike, a, a, any any thoughts or your question? Uh, sure, thanks, Alvin. Um, it was a question for my student or more homework for Ruchir. But before I do that, Ruchir, I just wanted to make a comment, um, if I might. Um, I I I wanted to thank you 
because not for your book, but for the ideas and the thoughts and the thought provoking that came out of it. I have learned so much from that book and it's been a real privilege to, as a teacher, have my student become my guru. So, but you're still my student. So what are you gonna work on next? Firstly, the word guru in your own words is used to describe someone who's an old fart. And I don't think that's a <laughs> definition. That was his words. I think the words you've used in my book are my teacher, but um, I don't know. There are lots of ideas, but um, just given the passion with which the last bit came out, enabling women leaders. And now that, uh, you know, I've also been very fortunate to have uh, three very inspirational women leaders who've endorsed the book, written about it. Um, Cheryl Sandberg, I, she's been quite a sponsor for me. Uh, and I truly think she's an uncommon leader. Uh, every time I interact with her, she blows me away. Uh, Kathleen Hogan at Microsoft and also Kiran Majumdar Shaw who's written the foreword. And I think having sort of interacted with these very successful women, but also inspiring leaders, I would love to do more um, research in this space in terms of how do we enable more women leaders? How do we bring more women into the boardrooms? Because believe it or not, those statistics, statistics haven't changed from 2015. They're stuck at 10% at the board level and 15% at the C-suite level. And I think we need to change that narrative because by your own admission, when we bring more women into organizations, the entire organization prospers. There's a lot more empathy. Women leaders have truly shown us the way during the pandemic as well. They have been a lot more successful at taking their people and their countries out of those pandemic conditions in a turbulent environment than a lot of the men leaders. Thank you, great, great answer. And so we're not done yet, but I would now as, as traditional booth, and I know you can see the background behind all, all three of us. And those of you that are in the Singapore campus or had the privilege uh, being you know, in the uh, Singapore AXP uh, side, this was the, the lounge of the Tan Yeok Yin building. And about this time, which is 9 p.m., we're already, well, fin finished work and having a wine or a beer in the, in the free beer and having some excellent, um, excellent discussion, either about life or about the program or, or, or anything in, under the sun. So I thought that would be great. I know, I, I know there's some problems with the chat group. So what would just is, Lenora, you can just open up the overall, make everyone uh, panelists and we can just have an open discussion for, for as long as we want, probably 15, 20 minutes to go through that. And I know we had some questions or people that wanted to ask questions. So we can just ask them freely through that, if that's okay. So if you can just open up everything, Lenora. Uh, good evening, one and all. Mubarak Ali from India. My, my voice is hearable, sir? Yes, we are. We can hear you. If you can turn uh, on video, that would be great, although I understand not everyone can do so because you're probably at home. Thanks, Professor. I'm doing right now. It's just nice to see you. Hi, Augustine. Yeah, pleasure is mine, sir. My name is Mubarak Ali from India. Thanks to the organizer for the this insightful session and for the opportunity. My question to Ruchira, madam. Madam, recently read your interview with Madan Mohan Rao and his book review. is very insightful, mm -hmm. madam, and it stimulates to read to your book also. <laughs> the excellent framework, madam, the four C's model, A, B, C, D, grow, R, A, R, A, arc. Uh, thanks for a briefing about the four C model, madam. I'm very interested to, uh, um, to, to, to know more about ARC, Madam ARC, architecture, rotiteness, and culture. And I wish to uh, know some more about the Japanese practice of Gemba. Please, Madam, and thanks for the opportunity. Um, thank you. Uh, you know, you've clearly, uh, I think you've dished out in the last maybe 30 seconds, three chapters. So you've clearly read the book very well. Thank you very much. Um, I, um, I, I want to be conscious that we're, it's everybody's time. So perhaps you can sort of uh, engage with me offline, but very quickly, Gemba is the act of coaching where the action is taking place, right? So you can coach in many ways. Um, it didn't come out during our session, but it's a good point to make. Coaching is not just about fixing 45 minutes or an hour that in a conference room that where you meet your coachee or your colleague or your team member three months from now. Coaching is everything that enables the individual to go higher right? Coaching is about uh, shining the light on someone, giving them more exposure, 
if your boss is bosses in town you give them that the platform to interact with the boss it's good for both of them it positions the individual many of the leaders have said that when they have new hires in the organization they take them along for meetings right senior level meetings so that positions the individual and also um, get makes a client think of them as somebody who can be trusted so coaching comes in many shapes and forms coaching is everything that you do to elevate uh you know to empower and engage the individual it could be those chance meetings in the corridors it could be uh, as i said uh, it's the corridors it's also conference rooms right so gemba is one of the many things and uh, if you drop me an email i'd be very happy to take you through the rest of the constructs that you talked about but uh, what you have just said to us uh, by reading the review it's literally three or four chapters all rolled into one so thank you i feel very flattered great students um for the opportunity and will you allow me to ask me one more question sir to the all the panelists please sure go ahead okay this is questions to alvin and professor mike and ruchi ram madam when was the last time you did something for the first time i think to be honest for me i think every day is groundhog day again <laughs> so i <laughs> i think we just keep on going the same thing i think uh when we do something new or even go things like i said go back on a plane i think that would be the first time all over again so i think right now i feel like i'm in the endless loop mike uh well, in first of all i'd like to briefly say hello to a dear friend of two dear friends of mine heloise and louis in singapore hi louis and heloise um i couldn't resist sorry those are the two little kids you see there they're they're wonderful friends um and since i'm an academic i'm lucky cuz i'm or highly stressed out because I'm always doing new things teaching new classes or adding new material every research project is different sometimes it's a new kind of data for example so sometimes i wish i was doing fewer new things and i'm meeting new students every day or new people like mubarak here fantastic thanks to for thank you any other questions no ruchiram i need to answer my questions i don't know the last time he did something for us on time please <laughs> i i got into a, i was asked to teach at the london business school um which was a first for me because i've been basically teaching in asia and it was at uh, it started at 10 pm india time went on till 2 am and i couldn't get my camera right sorted it was the first time i was doing uh, you know what they call breakout rooms on zoom it was a disaster for me so yes that was the first time and i will say since then i've become a lot more techno savvy Thank you and thanks for the opportunity and good day to all. Bye bye. Thank you. Any other questions? Winky has her hand up. Winky, please. Hi, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, this could be a long or short answer. Um, so I'm currently working at a quite a large, pretty diverse organization in New York. Um, just giving the current, I guess, a combination of trying to organize. Um, the asian workforce and trying to nurture the asian workforce from within uh we are also trying to design i guess uh employee run um coaching with support system so we could have professional development that's um beyond the um uh, official quote unquote um career development or nurturing um i'm wondering if you have any insights or comments or feedback um to run those initiatives because I would say this is um the most grassroots employee run initiatives and also in reflection of just um I work at a healthcare organization um even though stereotypically mm -hmm. there are lots of um doctors and nurses um I am a I guess I'm a on the business side um are Asians <laughs> but we don't see a lot of Asian faces in leadership um so um so that sort of also feeds into that initiative as well i will pause here and uh, see if the panelists have any feedback we'll i guess the guru question. answer we'll get the guru answer that first you're the guru but um <laughs> yeah well, one thing i i've been starting to to think about which means i don't have any answer is peer to peer coaching um because teamwork uh, this is an area i i was i hope that ruchir will also start thinking about in the future and we've discussed it a little bit offline um 
you know, it is a substitute or a complement to leaders as coaches, but um, having people have peer to peer coaching, I think is also worthwhile and might in many ways be more effective because you take out that hierarchical relationship. Sure. Um, and if you have people who are motivated to do so and care about it, it could be very effective. We do this in study groups, of course, in our academic programs and trying to replicate something like that. And my first thought uh, in an organization would be potentially valuable. And my first two thoughts on that, one is we have some examples of Booth. We have these, the Booth Women's Network, and you might look at that as a model and see what works or doesn't work well in that and learn something from that. But the other is that 4C plus framework would be something I'd be thinking of starting with, the competence and the confidence aspects and so forth. Um, I think those are really useful ideas. If I can just add to that, uh, the 4C, I think is the, is the outcome of coaching. What you might want to explore is also, there are some very um, well-established coaching models, frameworks like GROW. A lot of coaches use it and in, in the classes that I've taught, the leader as coach or the workshops I do, it's very popular because it gives you a frame of reference. It helps you construct or structure your coaching conversation. And often what happens is um, as leaders, as colleagues, we could be subconsciously coaching others. We ask them the right questions, but we don't structure it in a manner that yields the right result. So as you start thinking of your conversations in a more structured fashion, you will realize that uh, the output uh, will be a lot richer. I think everyone, so I teach a course in corporate governance and I've had a couple of students who've been CEOs of sometimes large organizations and occasionally I, I've had conversations with them. Richard's on far more of this kind of thing. But one thing that always struck me about them is their loneliness of their position. They're at the top of the organization and they're responsible for everything. And then they have the board, which is their parents who are gonna punish them or something. Um, and it, 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 an inference I, I drew from that is that CEOs need someone to talk to and they often find another CEO outside the organization. But I think that is true of everyone to some extent. In my job, every once in a while I have frustrations or challenges or whatever. And I, I have two or three colleagues who are peers. They're not above me or below me who I'll you know, go to to vent or to ask for advice and so forth. And institutionalizing that in some way I think is very valuable. Everyone needs someone to bounce their experience off of and see, am I overreacting? Am I underreacting? Is this something that's common? How should I respond to this? Um, so I think it's very healthy. I don't know, Wink, if we're giving you any advice about how, but I think we're, th I think we're both saying this is a good idea. Yes, yeah. um, the framework is, and um, I, I think, we're, we're not, you know, 40,000 people CEOs of the organization, but um, there's only one CEO of the organization. But I think it's also important just to echo what Professor Gibbs just said, um, to, to really create a peer-to-peer -peer network and create some framework uh, to start. Because we are actually, this is actually um, a live initiative. Um, so this is actually very timely and useful. Thank you. Really appreciate it. I may add, uh, Mike, what you just said would be also a fantastic application for an entrepreneur, someone who's just starting out with their own venture, because it gets very lonely when you have flatter structures, um, then everything is changing real time. Uh, you know, nobody, the reporting hierarchy is not well established. And yet you as the entrepreneur, as a founder or the co-founder will find himself or herself Sometimes at a loss, should I proceed? What could I do better? So I think peer coaching circles, especially if it's an entrepreneur, a founder uh, who's been successful in the past, they, those coaching circles can add a lot of value. So Winky, one quick idea would be to have your group um, read a common piece of writing on the topic you want them to start thinking about. Richard's book comes to mind is obvious, but um, I couldn't give you any discount on that. But she has some articles she's published that are freely available at no cost as well. You know, just to get people talking about the same idea, you know, thinking, of coaching each other on what are we going to do in our session? Anyway, um, Yuri has his hand up. Yeah. Good morning and evening to everyone. Good to see Mike. I think Mike, 
younger since I remember him 10 years ago. Yeah, I wish. <laughs> You're hiding in the dark, yeah, you were nice to see you. Yeah, I just thought that you might uh, want to look at Singapore once again, uh, because they don't have a virtual background, so it's a real one. So I just wanted to ask you a question, and uh, since uh, Richard mentioned also about the um, uh, circles, we do have the entrepreneurial circles for South Asia for the guys, to, because we all understand that we are lonely in this position of CEOs, and we need the support, and um, that's why we formed this group. And uh, since Mike also mentioned the um, um, his corporate governance course and uh, his uh, great book, Personal Economics in Practice, and I just saw that it is the third edition already of this book, uh, I'm surprised. So I just wanted to ask Mike um, how his current research is, uh, what it shows the difference basically of the concepts which uh, were mentioned in the book then and now. So in particular about hiring people, incentivizing them, retaining the retention and um, performance evaluation. And um, maybe you also found something interesting that struck you um, versus your previous research. And maybe you can share with us uh, all of that. Thank you so much. Gee, I don't know. I wanted to do a revision of the book, but the publishing industry is having a hard time and they said, no, I don't know if we will again or not. And my um, textbook co-author passed away last year. Um, it's a great question, though. My first answer is not much changes. People are the same as they have always been. Organizations are largely the same. There's a, a famous quote in, in French, Alphonse something or other, maybe Thomas Chevrier could say it for us. In English, it is the more things change, the more they stay the same. And I actually use that as a quote at the beginning of one of the chapters on job design. Um, so as a skeptical economist from Chicago, I don't think things change that much. Um, but young people, millennials and so forth, they do seem to want to have different work-life balance and trade-offs, possibly because we're getting wealthier over time. And I think that may change workplaces. Information technology has been having a huge effect since about 1980 and that continues to happen. It's disaggregating companies, breaking them up into smaller organizations, more um, with joint ventures and outsourcing and so forth. I think I need to add more discussion of that. Um, information technology, I think, is going to change. Oh, clearly, I have to add something now about virtual workplaces and work from home, because we're, we're going to be doing this forever now in some blended way. So that's going to have to be an important component. And I wouldn't have said that five years ago. Um, and one thing I'm starting to think about with an a accounting professor at LSE, who's a former collaborator of mine, is how will performance evaluation and monitoring, but I would also add coaching, um, change with information technology. So in the research we did, Sapiens is installing software and employee computers so that we can track every minute to within 15 second intervals. Of, are you working on apps that we've approved or are you watching YouTube videos? And this raises some very interesting questions, partly about privacy, partly about performance evaluation and so forth. And I don't have answers for that, but it's something we're starting to think about. We're, we're doing a literature survey right now. We have about a hundred articles. We have to sit down and read to think that one through. Thank you for that question. I really appreciate that. You're, you're pushing me. What's my next thing? Great. Any other questions from the from the floor? You're a good yeah, coach. So I, have, yeah, I had one question, maybe Ruchira and uh, and Mike, uh, both of you, right? So, so one thing that the last eighteen months have sort of taught us is, you talent has a, a bigger playground, right? So you can literally go out uh, and work. You can access talent from anywhere. So, you know, there's definitely. A proof that you know people can actually contribute value irrespective of where they are and you don't need to basically go find people in in, in a place where um, where your company is and a lot of companies especially uh, i don't know mike if, if you have seen the company called uh, antasian which is primarily a remote first company and they work with people all over the world uh, as these trends take on right like everything else this won't be like all companies won't work in that model but most companies would probably begin working along those lines. So what's, what is the impact for org design? And, and Ruthira, so again, coaches probably can now access 
a lot of people who want uh, or who need coaching, right? So how do you think, you know, one-to-one coaching virtually, you know, how, what are the things that one should watch out for, you know, both from a mentor and a mentee perspective? In the virtual setting, and maybe Mike, uh, for you is the org design uh, for a remote first world. I'm going to throw in a skeptical note. Um, I, I, as as Rajiv is is aware, I'm um, on the advisory board of an alumni uh, company that's founded in in Singapore, and it is really hard to collaborate with 13 hour time zone differences. It's extremely costly. It's cumbersome. It's slow. I'm really tired of getting up for a 7 a.m. call or staying awake for a 9:30 p.m. call. Sometimes both in the same day. Um, you know, so yes, it can be done and it is being done. And the reason it's being done is because there's value to do so, but it is costly. And so if we can avoid it, we shouldn't do it and we're not going to do it. So I think globalization is a reason why we do some of it, but we do a little bit at the margins, at the fringes. And most organizations are still going to be regionally based for most of what they do. And the second thing is, I think it really is important for people to get in the same room in the same building together to establish cultures and relationships and to have those unanticipated conversations that lead to new ideas and so forth. And when I read that Jeff Zuckerberg, Mark, Mark Zuckerberg says, everyone at Facebook can work 100% from home for the next year, I think he's fooling himself or he really likes living in Hawaii and he's gonna destroy shareholder value because of that. People need to interact with each other in person too. It doesn't mean all the time, but two days a week, three days a week or something like that. So organizations need to find ways to make that happen. Note how much trouble we go to that physical presences in Asia and Europe and fly the faculty and all the students to to be together when we possibly can. Um, I guess I'll leave it at that. My rant is over. (laughs) Ruchira. No, I can't agree with you more. In fact, um, I was writing an article thanks to you on coaching and leading in a hybrid world. And it starts out by saying how Goldman Sachs and uh, the likes of Morgan, uh, JP Morgan are calling their bankers back to office. And uh, Microsoft says that, you know, when you tether your employees to uh, the work desk, you're missing out a huge opportunity. And uh, it really is about a hybrid work environment. You know, there's a lot that needs to be uh, thought through you have to constantly experiment. You have to be curious. You have to write, ask all the right answers. How many days a week? What kind of work can be done from home? But clearly, there is evidence to tell us that not everything can be done in isolation from home. You need those connections. You need those bonds. You need the ability to interact with each other. And even now, if you look at the research, employees do want to come back. Um, it might change demographically. You'll see a lot of the millennials and the Gen Z uh, are more resistant to change, but you will find a lot of people like us would want to get back to work because they truly crave those interpersonal connections. Uh, getting together, collaborating, it sparks creativity, those reservoirs of innovation, you know, all of that has to come together. There is no right answer and things will constantly evolve, but having this blended work life a hybrid work life, two days, three days a week is here to stay. We have to embrace it and we need to find, um, we need to find the right balance and ensure that the days that people are in, we use those days constructively to collaborate, to think, to brainstorm, to produce better ideas and better services. Andy had a question in the chat. He asked, um, will the skill premium rise even more so I thought, if, if you don't mind, I'd like to answer that one really briefly. Um, so what he's referring to is since about 1980, globally on all seven, con- all six continents that have economies, um, what labor economists have found is that the, the we, we all know that those who are more skilled get tend, tend to be paid more. You know, you know, labor market rewards skills. Their employees are more productive. But that the... The increase in pay as a function of skills has risen over time dramatically since about 1980. This is mostly associated with the information technology revolution. This is a global phenomenon um, in developing and developed countries. And it continues to this day. Um, So Annie, I do think that's likely to continue. 
um, which will increase um, the extent of in economic inequality that we have also seen rise at the same time. But I'll add that there's two other aspects to that which we didn't realize as labor economists until recently. Labor market is also increasingly rewarding those who have social skills. And that's interesting for our discussion today because this suggests something about collaboration, coordination, leadership, coaching. Those things are also valued by the labor market. Those who have um, cognitive skills, but also social skills combined are the most valuable. And the th new piece of information in a study I just saw about a month ago is creativity and innovation skills has, has also being valued more over time by the labor market. So those are three things combined. Shouldn't be surprising, but it's nice to know those simple things. Great. Um, if that's the last question, maybe, uh, you know, first off, I want to thank the one, thank our panelists, uh, Prof Gibbs, Mike, uh, Richira for uh, having a really stimulating session. I know that we've, you know, had a great, uh, great discussion. I want to thank um, all, all the alumni and friends that have been on the uh, on this uh, 90 minutes for a really stimulating session. Uh, Rajiv, thanks to the Alumni Club of Singapore uh, for uh, allowing this to be the so the first one of your sessions, and also Lenora, CK, and Booth for uh, for hosting this event. So thank you very much.